Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Leonard Leo. On behalf of the directors, officers, and staff of the Federalist Society, it is my privilege to welcome you all to our 20, 2010 National Convention. November 2nd was a significant day in our nation's political history, but the preceding months were equally momentous because we saw during that time period what was perhaps an unprecedented number of Americans recalling the passions that led to our nation's independence and constitution. The Tea Parties they formed and joined have brought renewed and remarkably broad attention to the question that the Founding Fathers struggled with, how to install a government strong enough to govern, but limited enough to leave people with the maximum practical degree of freedom. Over the next three days, we will be exploring this challenge for limited constitutional government through a wide variety of panels, speeches, and debates that present a broad cross-section of perspectives. To get us started, I have the privilege of introducing the United States Senate's Republican leader, the Honorable Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Senator, you're no stranger to this convention or to the Federalist Society having dropped by many times over the years to open our proceedings. Uh, we're very thankful for your leadership and your friendship, and we're so pleased to have you here again. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me uh, in welcoming uh, Senator Mitch McConnell. Thank you very much for <clears throat> such a warm welcome. It is indeed um, a rather happy time for, for my side. Um, you know, after two rather grim elections in a row, 06 and 08, uh, we uh, had a much better day on November 2nd. And that's obviously <clears throat> what's on my mind this morning and what I'd like to share some observations about. Uh, but first, I, I do want to <clears throat> thank Leonard Leo for his extraordinary leadership of this organization. Um, it really is true that this is one of my favorite organizations in the whole uh, country. <clears throat> I really, <laughs> and I really don't say that to every group I speak to, I assure you. Um, I've been to uh, Federalist Society. Um, summer receptions that you've had for young people who are in law school, uh, events in my state. I really uh, admire this mission and think it is so important. And we'll be joining you along with my wife who used to serve in the uh, Bush cabinet, Elaine Chow, at, at uh, dinner tonight. So you're gonna see more of us, but we won't, we won't say anything tonight. <laughs> A lot has changed since uh, I was here uh, two years ago in this very month. Two years ago, the mainstream media was asking whether the Republican Party would even exist on Election Day 2010. And Democrats were talking about their permanent majority. Today, some wonder whether the mainstream media will be around by the next Election Day. <laughs> <laughs> and a few uh, weeks ago, one senior Democrat in the House uh, thought the only way he could get reelected was to announce that he had voted for John McCain in 2008. It didn't work, he lost. Uh, so we've seen uh, clearly a seismic shift in the political landscape. And it's no secret why. The White House wants you to believe they just did a lousy job of getting the message out. They were just too busy doing important things uh, to explain it adequately uh, to all of us. The results tell a very different story. Here's a little context on this election. And in order not to make these uh, statistics boring, I'm going to go very slowly. <laughs> because statistics can sometimes be pretty boring. This was the biggest pickup of House seats by either party in any election 
in any election since 1948. It was the biggest pickup of House seats by either party in a midterm since 1938. It was the biggest pickup of House seats by either party in a first term midterm since 1922. The biggest pickup of House seats for Republicans in a first term midterm in the history of our country. This was a big election by any definition. So this wasn't just a messaging failure. This wasn't just anger at Washington. This was a nationwide revolt, revolt against a party that had arrogantly dismissed the voters for two years. Democrats chose to ignore the American people, so the voters chose new lawmakers. And Republicans had something to do with it, too. There was some pundits say, well, this is, Democrats just fouled it up. What we did was stand on principle in united opposition to policies we thought were harmful to the country. Had we not done that, it would have not been a clear choice before the voters. They had to understand that these initiatives were not, quote, bipartisan, end quote. In other words, there was a difference of opinion here in Washington about the direction the country ought to take. When the voters went to the polls, they knew whose side we were on, and it was theirs, and it made a big difference. Now, that doesn't mean Republicans should gloat. We shouldn't. It means both parties need to realize who's really in charge, and that's the people. And we're grateful for the opportunity to try to right the ship. We got the message. Americans want less government, less spending, and less debt. And above all, they want us to reacquaint ourselves with the idea of limited government. We just come through a two-year period where we saw the government take over just about everything it could get its hands on. Banks, car companies, insurance companies, the mortgage business, the student loan business, and of course, health care. Government is getting bigger, costlier, and more intrusive, and the trend needs to be reversed if we want to keep from turning ourselves into France. Consider this. During the Kennedy administration, according to one study, federal funds, federal funds as a percentage of state expenditures, federal funds as a percentage of state expenditures, stood at 12.9%. Today, the federal government is the big, biggest single source, the biggest single source of revenue for state and local governments, more than the state income tax, more than the sales tax, more than the property tax. So the growth of the federal government of the state is out of control. Voters want us to try to get back on the road to limited government and constitutional limits. But Republicans still need to do some work to re-earn their trust. That means rethinking the way we've done things in the past. Democrats have ignored the, pe the American people for two years. Now that we've begun to win back the voters' trust, we will not be found guilty of the same thing, I assure you. So we've determined to challenge not only Democrats, but ourselves as well. Our first goal is to begin to reverse the damage that's been done. In that regard, we are serious about repealing and replacing the health care bill. We will make the case for repeal through vigorous oversight and votes on full repeal of this terrible bill, even as we vote to eliminate its worst parts. 
and will continue to fight it in the courts. I recently took a lead on this effort by filing an amicus brief in support of the multi-state challenge to this law. Not only does this bill create 159, 159 new bureaucratic entities, including two massive new entitlement programs, as you all know, it also compels every American to buy insurance, health insurance, whether they want it or not. This so-called individual mandate is an unprecedented and unauthorized extension by the Congress of its authority to, quote, regulate commerce among the several states. For the first time, Congress isn't regulating an economic activity in which its citizens have chosen to engage. It's mandating that citizens engage in economic activity that they purchase a particular product and saying it will punish those who do not. If this mandate is deemed constitutional, there will be no longer any meaningful limit whatsoever on Congress' power to regulate its citizens under the Commerce Clause. And Congress' specific power under that clause will be transformed into a general police power, all but eliminating the constitutional distinction between federal and state regulatory activity. As the Supreme Court has noted, the, the, the framers conceived of limitations on government to ensure protection of our fundamental liberties. By preventing the accumulation of excessive power, the Constitution is designed to reduce the risk of tyranny or abuse from either the state or federal government. The health care bill would remove an important bulwark of this protection. So fighting this mandate couldn't be more important. And I know I can count on the support of the Federalist Society in helping us in our challenges to this affront to the Constitution. Our other goals in the Senate include putting an end to the bailout mentality, significantly cutting spending, and significantly shrinking the size and the scope of government. Americans have also made it clear they think government is spending too much of their money. So we will vote to freeze and cut discretionary spending. We will fight to make sure that any spending bill that reaches the Senate floor is amendable so members can vote for the spending cuts Americans are asking for. We will push to bring up and vote for House passed spending rescission bills. We'll work hard to ensure Democrats don't raise taxes on anybody, and we mean on anybody. And when it comes to educating the public about the effects of democratic legislation, we will fulfill our constitutional duty to oversee the executive branch through smart, aggressive oversight. We'll scrutinize democratic legislation and force them to defend it. Now here are some of the obstacles that lie ahead in the next two years that we need to be realistic about. First. The Democrats, at least in the Senate and the White House, still set the agenda. November 2nd was just an important first step. It didn't finish the job. Second, the President has the veto pen, not an inconsequential power. Third, Democrats still won't acknowledge their policies are the problem, so they're not likely to cooperate. Another obstacle that uh, John Boehner and I both are working on is to make sure we don't misread the mandate. And candidly, ladies and gentlemen, this election, November 2nd, was not about us. It was about them. It was about them. And one of the most uh, dangerous things for a new majority to engage in is to misunderstand how they got where they are. So we have our work cut out for us. But Americans spoke clearly, and Republicans are united in our determination to respond. We intend to follow through on what voters want, and what they want are some limits. Some limits. They want a government that respects the Constitution and that respects them. None of this is to say Republicans have given up on cooperating with the President. 
but the voters sent a clear message that the administration needs to come toward us. And if there's any message out of this election for the Democrats, it's certainly not to keep on doing what they've been doing. I think we will all agree. So the path forward is for the president to respond to what voters clearly had on their minds and come in our direction. We can work together to prevent a tax hike on small businesses, and we'll have to do that very quickly. We can work together on energy independence, cutting spending, or increasing American exports by completing free trade agreements that have been languishing now for some four years. And we can continue to work together to give our armed forces in Afghanistan, Iraq, and around the world whatever they need to accomplish their mission. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, that's our approach uh, going forward, an approach informed by a renewed commitment to constitutional conservatism and by a humbled but determined effort to do the work the voters expect from us. By sticking to our game plan and with the help of groups like the Federalist Society, we'll succeed. I thank you all very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here this morning, and I look forward to seeing all of you again tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs>